Good morning. I want to welcome everyone back. I'm Congressman Joe Crowley, chair of the Democratic Caucus, and I'm uh, happy to be joined by my good friend and colleague, uh, the vice chair of the Democratic Caucus, uh, generally from California, Ms. Uh, Linda Sanchez. Uh, we had a uh, 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 a little over an hour long uh, meeting this morning of the Democratic Caucus where we had a robust discussion about uh, the tax bill uh, that is before us uh, this week, uh, the Senate, or at least before the Senate this week, uh, reminding our colleagues uh, that the devastation that this tax bill will have on the American taxpayer, uh, the taxes are a very personal issue. And what we know from uh, the Senate tax bill uh, that is being moved very quickly through the Senate now. Uh, is uh, a bill that will actually, according to the uh, JTC, the Joint Tax Commission, will raise uh, taxes on 70% of the middle class if this bill becomes law. That's 82 million households that will see a tax increase over the next decade. Uh, this bill is even, it's, it's doubly as worse to, uh, to the middle class as the House bill was, which was already a disaster. Um, they're rushing this bad bill through uh, purely for a political win. And uh, as Mr. Collins uh, from Buffalo has said repeatedly, uh, or at least it has been uh, retweeted repeatedly, uh, his initial tweet that this is about their donors. This is about their political base. This is about ensuring that their special interest corporations' needs are met. It's about ensuring for them that the wealthy in this country get the tax cut that they are begging for. And so uh, we, will, we, are, we are united as a Democratic caucus in opposition not only to the House bill that passed, uh, but certainly to the bill that is before the Senate uh, this week. Uh, we will not waste uh, time um, uh, uh, discussing uh, the issues as to whether or not this bill has merit. It has none. Uh, this is not a good bill for the American people. This is a political uh, stunt. It is a scam. And if it becomes law, we believe it will be devastating on our nation's uh, economy. Um, we also uh, believe that if the president is really uh, true to his word about negotiating, uh, he will stop tweeting. He will stop uh, using modern technology in many respects uh, to express his inner thoughts as it relates to the leadership of the House and Senate Democrats. Uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and both the House Democrats and Senate Democrats stand ready to negotiate a budget uh, resolution. We stand ready to, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, a CR, we, st uh, we stand ready uh, to work uh, in a bipartisan way to find solutions to the issues that are facing the American people, including uh, what has happened in uh, hurricane-ravaged portions of our nation in Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands and elsewhere, uh, that we stand ready to work on the issue of CHIP uh, and to see that that, is, uh, uh, that it has continued for 9 to 10 million uh, uh, children throughout our country, that we stand ready in a myriad of issues, uh, not the least of which is the issue of DACA and the Dreamers, to see that their lives can continue uh, as productive uh, individuals in our country, uh, and many other issues uh, that, that need to be negotiated and worked through. We believe that there is common ground on many of these issues, uh, and that it's time for the President uh, to uh, really put away childish games and really uh, invite people to a, a table of negotiation where there is respect and understanding uh, of the needs of, 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 uh, of all. So with that, let me uh, turn to my good friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Sanchez, with some comments, and we'll take questions. Sure. Thank you, Joe, and good morning, everyone. Uh, there are a mere 11 legislative days left in 2017. So there isn't a whole lot of time to get everything done before the end of the year, all of the business that our government needs to accomplish. Time is ticking, and Republicans ultimately have the responsibility for keeping the government open. They control all of the branches of government. They control a majority in the United States House of Representatives. And if they're looking to come to the Democrats for votes that they should be able to accomplish within with just their caucus alone, um, then we are going to ask for things in return. We have made our priorities very clear. Democrats want to see something happen to provide legislative relief for DREAMers. So we need a legislative fix for deferred action for childhood arrival kids. Democrats want to see CHIP reauthorized. That is the Children's Health 
plan that is run through states. States are running out of money. That expired at the end of September. Republicans have not done anything to address the CHIP reauthorization. We want to see additional disaster recovery aid for the affected areas in the United States, which includes the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, uh, Texas, and Florida. And we want to see the taxpayer subsidy CSR payments uh, continue so that millions of Americans can continue to afford their health insurance. Democrats have been ready to work with congressional Republicans to finish all of these items before the end of the year. But Republicans have got to want to work with Democrats. And we want to make very clear what our expectations are for an agreement. And we intend to use the leverage that we possess to get that done. So far, they've chosen a go-it approach on health care. They've chosen a go-it-alone approach on taxes. Um, and now they seem headed towards a go-it-alone approach on CR. It is time to get America's business done. No excuses, no whining, no complaining, but good old, old-fashioned, roll up your shirt sleeves and work with your colleagues to get things done. So I'm hopeful that Republicans will get the message that um, we will work with them so long as there is an honest and sincere intent on their part. We're not here for theatrics. We're here to try to get America's business done. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe for questions. Can we talk about this, the CR for just a moment here? What about if, if Republicans might be calling your bluff? I know what the history has been on these debt ceiling and government shutdown bills where they've always had to have help from your side because they can't pass it on their own. But because of the way that this played out, uh, there's the potential maybe to steal the resolve of Republicans maybe to say if it's a, a minimal bill that just keeps the government open. They don't need your side in there, so you don't get doctor, you don't get disaster aid, some of the things the Democrats want. Is that a risk? Do you think that, that there's potential that maybe Democrats overplayed their hand? What is the risk? The risk no, 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 that's a rhetorical question. What is the risk? <laughs> they control the House of Representatives. Yeah. They control the Senate. They have majorities in both houses. Uh, Leader Pelosi has said consistently, if you have the votes, pass your budget. If you have your votes, pass your CR. And they haven't had them. Uh, and uh, the reality is uh, that we've recognized for some time that Washington is out of balance, that there are, uh, there really is no check and balance when it comes to the legislative branch right now. They, they control the presidency, the Senate, and the House. So if they have the votes, they'll exercise it. Uh, we hope that for the sake of the American people, we think that the uh, best, best legislation, the best legislation is one that is put together in a bipartisan way. From the outset, this notion or idea, these crocodile tears from the Senate, the boo-hoo that's going on that they say there's a lack of democratic participation. You know, there was a the, 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 uh, the use of the budget resolution uh, for, C for, for um, uh, reconciliation was done to only need 50 votes in the Senate. That meant they only needed their own votes to pass anything. They weren't looking for a more robust uh, involvement by Democrats where you could have had a 60 vote uh, uh, need that would have required uh, the involvement of Democrats uh, in the Senate. Certainly that what happened here in the House, I know people don't care about procedure, but the reality is we were never invited to, be, to participate uh, in this. Uh, we saw how quickly this bill went through the committee uh, here in the House without a single uh, committee hearing. Uh, so uh, those are all crocodile tears. Uh, somehow they uh, they can't work with Democrats. They never involved Democrats in the first place. I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just echo that they have this unique ability to uh, lock us out of the room and then cry that we're not at the table. And it's completely disingenuous. It's uh, hypocritical. Um, and they, again, are the party that is in charge of governing they have the majority. Let's see if they can do, uh, if they can accomplish uh, our country's business uh, with their votes. They didn't lock uh, the leaders out of the room yesterday. The leaders decided not to go to the White When you are verbally demeaned and attacked via Twitter uh, and shown so little respect, um, 
I don't think it's a clear invita invitation to come sit at a table and have a real honest discussion. Our president is a bully. He loves to demean other people, verbally abuse them, and then he's surprised that people don't want to sit down and have a civilized conversation with him. You know, I think the president could go a long way towards uh, building relationships if he just didn't attack people and he kept his mouth shut. Apparently, he has a problem doing that. Mr. Crowley, yes. The leaders, uh, including myself, and I'll say on behalf of uh, Ms. Sanchez as well, as well as the members of the Democratic Caucus, uh, believe that these are very, very, very serious allegations that have been laid forth. Uh, and that um, uh, understanding uh, that the sensitivities here that are involved, uh, and that's why we have called for a full ethics investigation and an immediate investigation, uh, so that at the end of the day, that there will be accountability. And most importantly, accountability on behalf of the women, the brave women who've come forth uh, uh, with these allegations. Yeah. I would just like to add the following. I think we are at a turning point uh, in our country's consciousness where, and I practiced employment and labor law before I ever became a member of Congress. And the presumption used to be that when complainants came forward um, with allegations, the natural inclination was to disbelieve them. And that's why it was so hard for so many uh, people to get the justice that they deserve. I think our consciousness has finally shifted to where the presumption now, at least uh, among the public, is that if there are allegations that are made and uh, somebody comes forward, the presumption is, hey, there's merit or there may be merit to this claim. It's not an automatic uh, dismissal that this can't possibly be true. And I think that's a good thing, because I think many people have had to suffer in silence for too long. I believe that with the bill that we have on the floor today, which would require uh, uh, sexual harassment training, that's a good first step, because prevention is always uh, uh, the best starting point. I believe that there are, and this is something that's not commonly known, there are several processes in Congress by which somebody can make an allegation. One is through the Ethics Committee, which is a separate and completely distinct uh, uh, process from OOC, which is the Office of Compliance, which I think we all agree has some very outdated, onerous hurdles for complainants to try to overcome before they can ever have their day in court. We are having very serious ongoing discussions about how we can reform that process and how we can educate those who work on the Hill about where they can go to seek redress if they have these complaints. And I think that we ha had a very fruitful discussion in the caucus today about what we need to do moving forward to try to make the process a fair one because the process needs to be fair for all parties involved. It needs to be fair for the complainant and it needs to be fair for the person that's being accused. They need, they, they need to have due process and you need to have uh, triers of fact uh, verify and see whether um, complaints are, uh, if there is evidence to support those. Uh, you don't want character assassinations, nor do you want victims um, that don't get their day in court. And I, th I think we will continue to work at, um, uh, at producing something which will make that process a better and a fairer one. I think that is one of the most compelling issues facing working Americans today, their ability to have both uh, the need, unfortunately, in many respects, for both parents to have to, to work. Uh, and that's certainly, uh, in some many households, um, something that's welcome. They want to be able to continue their careers as well. Uh, and to have, the, uh, have a high deductibility, to, to, to be able to access more help from the federal government in terms of making that happen through child care, uh, knowing uh, not only that there's more uh, resources for it, but that, uh, that uh, uh, their child is, and I think more needs to be done to ensure that there's safety standards in, in, the, in, the, in the settings that those children are in, that they're being uh, uh, looked over and cared for by qualified individuals who are well paid, uh, and, um, 
I, you know, there are a myriad of issues I think that uh, that, that this issue uh, uh, really uh, touches on, uh, and uh, this is something that both Linda, myself, and Democrats have been have been supportive of. Uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, one, uh, they're, they're identifying something that may be positive within the bill does not make a bill a good bill uh, in and of itself. There's so much, there's so many erroneous aspects to this bill. There are so many problems with this bill. Uh, either the House version or the Senate version uh, that make it non-starters for Democrats. Linda? I would just add on the um, child provision. Clearly, they want to tout this as some kind of boon to the middle class, but the House bill, um, their provision, the eligibility requirements for that meant that those on the lowest economic ends uh, could not claim that increased credit um, and that those who were higher income earners uh, now qualified for the benefit. So if you look at how that benefit is distributed, uh, those who earn more are actually going to be the beneficiaries of that provision, not those that are lower income earners and need the help the most. Um, the difficulty that we have is, although there are Senate provisions that may be different than the House bill, ultimately they will need to reconcile um, what is in the House bill with what is in the Senate bill. Um, and, as, and, and as Joe said very aptly, one provision in the bill uh, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't make the whole bill better. Uh, we think that both of the bills are irresponsible and reckless, and um, I will be voting no on their tax bill. Yes. I believe that Congress should be not the gold standard, but the platinum standard. We should be a beacon on a hill uh, to say that uh, sexual harassment or harassment of any kind is not acceptable in the workplace anywhere, whether it be in media, on Wall Street, in uh, any departments or public or private departments in our country, and that we need to set that gold standard. I believe, as Linda has indicated, the legislation that, or the resolution that's before the House in terms of of uh, requiring uh, sexual harassment training uh, for all members of Congress and for all employees here on the Hill is a good st is a start. But we have a, we have a calling for the resignation of someone does not actually create the resignation. So uh, the reality is we have a process in, in place and we're calling for an expedited process of the Ethics Committee uh, to bring this to uh, to the forefront. So there can be a, 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 as, as much transparency as possible, uh, recognizing the rights of uh, the alleged, uh, uh, the, the, those who are bringing uh, the, these very, very serious uh, allegations uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, Mr. Conyers. And again, this is my legal training, but I am not a trier of fact in this. I don't know all the facts. I don't know the specific allegations. Uh, it appears that there is more than one complainant, which does heighten my sense of there may be something there, but again, I can't sit and judge a member and, and call for the res resignation unless there has been, you know, unless I've been party to hearing all of the evidence and 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 hearing the defense of the evidence. And 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 trust me, again, I prosecuted our, uh, sexual harassment and employment discrimination cases, but you know, I have seen cases where there were cases without merit. I've, I, I've seen that as well. We want it to be a fair process for both. We have asked for an expedited investigation by the Ethics Committee. Um, we understand that they have undertaken that charge and are working towards that end right now. I think it is right that um, Congressman Conyers stepped down from his ranking uh, uh, member post on the Judiciary Committee, uh, and we will wait to see uh, where the chips fall. And, and, and based on what the trier of facts decide, if there are consequences to be meted out, that there is accountability and there are consequences. I would just add for the end point here, as Linda just said, at the end of the day, uh, and as the chair of the Democratic Caucus, I will do everything I can to ensure that there is accountability at the end of the day, as it pertains to this particular case, and especially uh, accountability on behalf of uh, the individuals who have brought these allegations forward. So, yeah, Mike, you come. Last if, if we don't know the facts and we're waiting for this ethics investigation to conclude, then it sounds very much like Leader Pelosi is working behind the scenes with some members of the CDC to force a resignation or to compel a resignation even before the ethics investigation 
is done. What do you say to that? Is that premature? Well, I, 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 I read uh, that there was a meeting that took place yesterday, and there was a statement made by the chair of the CBC uh, in regards to the uh, discussions that were made uh, or had with uh, Mr. Conyers. Uh, so, uh, listen, I think uh, Mr. Conyers has gone back to his district. I think he's, uh, he's probably um, at this point, I can't speak for what he's doing, but I uh, su suppose he's uh, taking counsel from his family as well as constituents, the people who sent him to Washington. Uh, and I believe at the end of the day, the right thing will be done. I think uh, that accountability will be had uh, and that um, we need to focus ourselves right now as to what we can do. And that is ensuring uh, that there is a platinum standard when it comes to the issue of sexual harassment, or harassment on the job, uh, right here on Capitol Hill, that we're second or third or third rate to no, no entity in this country. Thank you.